from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast focused on the concerns of the contemporary figurative sculptor. I am your host, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and instructor living and working in Florence, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today we're going to be talking about Track 2015. Track T-R-A-C, stands for the Representational Art Conference. Last week, Track convened for the third time in four years in Ventura, California, where it is sponsored by the California Lutheran University. According to Track's website, Track is the academic conference exploring representational art's place in the 21st century. Over 400 artists, educators, and academics gathered for four days to attend dozens of presentations by leaders in the field of representational painting, philosophy, art history, and more. Keynote speakers included Elliot Bostwick Davis, who is curator from the Museum of Fine Art in Boston, the founder of the Art Renewal Center, Fred Ross, and Dr. Zamir Zeki, professor of neuroaesthetics at University College London, as well as the sculptor Richard MacDonald. Dozens more spoke or presented academic papers. Other events included nine different demonstrating artists, a juried exhibition, an off-site gallery, museum, and studio tour, and a gala dinner. In short, it's the biggest event of the year for representational artists, and practically the only one of its kind. I spoke to several people connected with Track 2015 in various ways. Alicia Ponzio is a California-based sculptor who gave a demonstration on figure modeling in clay from life at Track 2015. Poppy Field is a student of sculpture and of art history, currently studying at the Courtauld Institute in London, who also presented a paper at Track. And I also talked to Michael Pierce, painter, university professor, and the co-founder of Track with his colleague, Michael Lynn Adams. Let's listen to the interview I did with Michael Pierce first to get more of a sense of the aims and goals of Track 2015. Michael Pierce, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me today about Track 2015. I'm very excited to hear how, it's, how it went. It, it, would just, it just happened last week, right, from November 1st to the 4th. That's right, first through fourth. It was uh, it was pretty fantastic. We had a, a large number of people show up, a little under 400 people uh, came to the event. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've often worried about if, you, you know, we live in California here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're right on top of an earthquake fault. I've, I've occasionally worried if there was a major earthquake right on top of track to wipe out the entire representational art community in well, one uh, go. Truthfully, <laughs> truthfully, Michael, that's actually why I stayed away this year. So, <laughs> well, thank God. <laughs> I, someone's got, someone's got to some live survive. on. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, can you tell me more about your, your role in Track? You actually uh, are a co-founder of Track. That's correct. Me and Mike Adams founded the event uh, in 2012 was the first Track. Uh, so we started working on it in 2011. Amazing. What was, uh, the, what was the motivation behind organizing Track? Wow. Um, well, Mike had gone to an event down at Alexi Steele's studio and uh, had a really nice time uh, with uh, six or seven other artists. And it was very communal and, and uh, there was some discussion and conversation. And uh, Mike came back up here and he was talking to me and he, he said, um, you know, it was so nice to get everyone together and so pleasant. And um, that got me thinking uh, about the uh, about conferences because – um, for art professors, there were just no conferences to go to, which really spoke about representational art. Uh, in the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the listings of art conferences, you would never see uh, anything about representation specifically. And I trolled through uh, all of the conference websites that I could find and couldn't find any mention of any representational art at all. And so uh, it uh, seemed to me that we could combine a uh, sort of a social gathering uh, and uh, an academic affair uh, at the same time and make this uh, a very successful event. Well, I walked across the park one day and we were talking about this and we said, you know, we've got to do something about this. It's no good just talking about it. We, we need to put something together. And uh, so we, we put together, a, you know, a plan of what we'd like to do and went to see uh, our, our president here at the university and uh, Chris Kimball, Dr. Chris Kimball. Uh, and somewhat to our surprise, he said, do it. 
<laughs> Fantastic. And, and, and we're we talking out of the office. I'm sorry. We're talking about uh, <laughs> we're talking about California Lutheran University, correct? In Ventura? Yes, or no, no, in uh, Thousand Oaks, Thousand Oaks, California. We're in Thousand Oaks, California. It's in Ventura County, which is where, where your confusion is coming from. Mm -hmm. The uh, the conference, of course, takes uh, place in Ventura, the city, uh, which is the capital city of Ventura County. Right, right. And so California Lutheran University is, uh, it's basically a sponsored event. I think I read on the website uh, for track that it was, it's a cultural, an international cultural event sponsored by California Lutheran. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, CLU underwrites the conference and picks up the tab, and uh, they've uh, they've been great supporters of what we've done. Uh, they've they've never protested. They're wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> I'm uh, glad to Chris hear they've never protested. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Looking at the website, and of course, you know, I'm on the mailing list, and so I get you know several <laughs> emails a week about track. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's 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 got an amazing sort of organizational wing to it. Is that you or is that the university? I mean, there's definitely some sort of infrastructure going on there that uh, that's you know behind the wheel of the the marketing, the sponsorship, the uh, promoting of track. It seems very very impressive. Yeah, um, we have a really good team. Uh, I run all the con uh, all the content uh, of the event. Um, then uh, Mike does the more administrative work, uh, and uh, then we have uh, uh, Jeff, who's our event planner, and he takes care of our relations with the hotel and making sure that everything runs smoothly actually during the event. Uh, Cindy takes care of all of our sponsors and uh, uh, people who are supporting us uh, financially and advertising and so forth. Uh, it's uh, it's really quite a, a tight team. Uh, Rachel Schmid recently uh, joined us uh, this year. She took over running the uh, exhibit part of the event over at the hotel with the assistance of Gerald Swerth. We all get along very well and uh, work together well, thank goodness. Uh, and uh, it's it's a really good team. Our team is fabulous. <laughs> They're such good people. Let me ask you, now that you've you've organized track, and this is the, the third iteration, track 2015 was the third uh, event. Uh, I think there was track 2013. No, I'm sorry, track 2012, and then 2014, and now 2015, yeah, we, correct? Right. We, we've uh, done it every year and a half, you see. Um, it, it, it's so much work. People don't realize what a gigantic amount of work it is to put the thing on. And uh, uh, for us to do it each year would just kill us. We, we, we would literally die. Uh, it's uh, it's tough enough doing it every year and a half. It's exhausting. <laughs> so um, yeah, we do it. Uh, we do it uh, for ourselves, frankly. Sure. No, so then, schedule. so then the next one, uh, and I know you just came off the last one. You probably don't want to think about the next one. Uh, but is that's so? That's probably going to be in the spring of 2017, thereabouts. Well, we we don't know if there's going to be a next one at the moment. It really depends on the will of the president. Uh, so at the moment, we I can't confirm or deny. You know what I mean? There's, yeah, there's, yeah. I don't, I don't have a good solid answer. I didn't realize that. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. That's that that would be a potential bummer if it didn't happen again. Because I really want to go. Well, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you so, never know. We'll see. So let's assume that it's going to continue. <laughs> and based yeah. upon that assumption, where do you see track headed? Where what are the goals you would like to, to meet or events you would like to see the conference host? I, it's more than getting together, I think, and, and, and talking about that. That can happen in several ways and certainly probably with a lot less effort on your on your part. Um, if it, if it were to be just uh, a meeting of like minds, um, do you have any sort I of think, long term goals for track? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've said at each at each uh, conference, in fact, at the end of the conference, that I want to see track go home with the people who come to it. Uh, I, I want to see track being uh, being the the fire starter uh, that people uh, get set light by. And then they go home and they set up their own events, set up uh, groups, set up discussion meetings, get symposia going, talk about representational art and find uh, authority uh, by writing about it. Get magazines going, get, uh, get galleries going, do whatever it takes to get this work out there. 
uh, set up alternative spaces and, and fill them with representational art. And that's, uh, that's really my hope for what track can do, is to draw together the community. So we know now who we are. We know each other, thanks to track. It's been a really great catalyst for drawing the community together. You know, when you're when you're speaking just now, it makes me it reminds me of uh, TED Talks. I'm sure you're familiar with TED Talks, um, how it's, yeah. it started out as a as a as, as a conference um, TED standing for technology, entertainment and design and um, and its popularity through, you know, posting the talks on the Internet has led to satellite events. Uh, I think they're called TEDx and they're all over the world. Um, was, is that something you'd like to see happen with uh, track? Do you think track could become sort of like representational art TED and sponsor in some way or be affiliated with sort of satellite venues, satellite conferences around the world? I think that's a distinct possibility. Uh, track has to morph and become something else. I think uh, it needs to spread and uh, and go to other places in the world. And, uh, you know, we'll make decisions about what we want to do with the with the conference name and and how we support other people in these kinds of efforts uh, in the next six months or so. I'm sure. Uh, as we make uh, decisions about the future, uh, but uh, yes, is the answer. I would, I would personally love to see that happening. I'd love to see uh, us go to Florence, for example, where you are. Why not? There's a, a strong center representation of art there. How about Barcelona? There's the Miam uh, right there. there. There are these sort of thriving centers of representation of art, which uh, uh, would do very well by having conferences and events taking place uh, in their in their venues. Uh, so. Uh, yes, is the answer to that. I would like to see more. Well, is there a possibility of um, maybe at the next track actually streaming some of the talks and demonstrations online, or recording them on a video and putting them out as as YouTube clips? Or uh, we did have some uh, video out there. We wouldn't stream it live. We would only uh, the event um, uh, because uh, otherwise, why would anyone come to the conference? <laughs> 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 so, okay, yeah, <laughs> so um, uh, yes, is the answer. Uh, the streaming video and using, making better use of the internet uh, definitely is an important tool uh, in what we uh, want to achieve. Mm. Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here and and ask you. Uh -oh. No, it, it, don't worry. <laughs> I want to ask you about <laughs> uh, about sculpture and sculptors. My question is. Um, well, it's not really a question. I guess it's sort of a, a comment, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, track, like most similar events held within the realm of representational art, um, is, I think, quite naturally tilted heavily towards painting and drawing uh, rather than sculpture. For instance, I understand, um, you know, just to use track as an example, and this, again, is not a criticism. It's only a, an observation. You know, for instance, I, I understand there were no vendors selling sculpture supplies at track, although there were several, you know, vendors for painter supplies. And only one of the nine uh, demonstrating artists was a sculptor. The other eight were, were painters and drawers. Um, there was a sculpture, a uh, sculptor represented as a keynote speaker, Richard McDonald, um, who is a fantastic person to have, I think, as a keynote speaker. And again, before I go any further, I don't want to give the impression I'm, I'm you know, criticizing or blaming uh, anyone uh, for this lopsidedness, because in part it's the fault of the sculptors. Um, but it's, but it's, for me, it's, um, it speaks to a larger problem endemic in representational art in general. There, there are fewer uh, sculptors. There are fewer ateliers that offer sculpture. Competitions and exhibitions in representational art are more problematic for sculptors who work in materials that are expensive and heavy. And basically, it just imposes serious limits on the quality and quantity of sculpture visible in the representational art world. Basically, there are just tons of issues regarding uh, sculptors that I think need to be in, uh, addressed in terms of you know, visibility and representation within the representational movement. But I also think it's it's the low visibility of sculptors is such a problem that I don't even know if painters or atelier teachers, uh, historians or events organizers are even aware of the problem. I'm just wondering um, your perspective on it and what what you think uh, what you think our problem is <laughs> in terms of sculpture. Yeah. 
Well, the, the first and most pragmatic problem is the, the problem of cost, right? It's extremely yeah. expensive to do sculpture. Bronzing anything is it's just a fortune. So uh, that dissuades a lot of people from entering into the, into the practice. Um, so that's the, the, the most simple and prob uh, biggest problem facing the uh, promulgation of sculpture uh, mm -hmm. at any, at any you know, really serious professional level. I love sculpture myself. You know, we've got an exhibit here at the uh, university, uh, Richard MacDonald, who, who mentioned a minute ago. Um, he's loaned us 12 of his monumental pieces. And, uh, boy, they lift up the camp, the campus here. It's, um, it's just transformed by having these sculptures here. It's classier and more elegant yeah, with I these pieces uh, in the landscape. I was talking with Alicia Ponzio about this, how um, it's, it's almost ironic that... Uh, Sculpture is, is a bit less uh, visible in the representational art movement, but by and large, it's through public sculpture, like what you had just described with Richard McDonald's work on campus. It's, it's through public art, and that usually means sculpture, that the public, especially the non-art-loving public, interacts with representational art. You know, if you're not a person who's going to seek out art in a gallery, you're most probable contact with art is going to be through public art and that's generally sculpture and that's something that uh, yeah, yeah. that never really gets addressed in the representational art scene we don't talk about public art well yes indeed yeah yeah and sculptors do get a hell of a lot of attention when they uh, when they can figure out how to cross over that problem of financing major work don't they yeah, uh, you know, yeah. I think of Jeff Koons's balloon dogs, for example. I mean, they're, they're internationally famous. Perhaps not the best example of, of, of uh, uh, finessed uh, neoclassical work, of course, but uh, but nevertheless, internationally famous representational art. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, sculpture, when it is done on a monumental scale, can be profoundly visible uh, and have a very deep impact upon the upon the public yeah right uh, and, much more so than paintings but you tend to have to go into a, a you know a, a gallery in order to view it exactly but but a rising tide lifts all boats if you can raise the visibility of representational yeah. art through sculpture that might encourage people to go into galleries and seek yeah. representational art there i think so i would encourage anyone listening who has even the slightest interest in in helping the representational art movement uh, to uh, uh, invest in sculpture and get it into public places but invest in, particularly in really good quality imaginative representational art that captures the public's attention i think that's super important yeah i do too i do too yeah and i th and it's it's a shame i think i think sculpture really is probably now it's probably about where painting and drawing was in the mid '90s. When I first started studying at Charles Cecil Studio in 1996, you know, it, it was one of the very few places around the world where you could you could study. You know, I mean, there was yeah, you know, there was Charles and there was Dan at Florence Academy, and they were both about the same size at the time, uh, maybe about right. 30 students each. Um, yeah, there, there was you know Atelier Lac, or I think at that point it was just the Atelier or whatever it's called in Minneapolis, and you know, and there's nothing in London, you know, very few opportunities elsewhere. You know, you had, you know, Lyme Academy, you had New York Academy of Art. And that was it. And that was it. And now there's just hundreds of, of ateliers. Oh, for, for, tons of them, yeah. Yeah, for painters. <laughs> for painters. Yes. For sculpture, yeah. much fewer, much fewer. But uh, it's a generational thing. You know, Rob Bodum uh, has trained a generation of sculptors who are opening up ateliers. I've got about a half dozen different uh, former students, it's it'll get there, but, but yeah. yeah, we are making progress. The world is becoming a better place, and uh, you know, we're we're uh, I think instrumental in doing that, aren't we? All all of us working in representational art are doing that. Yeah, uh, we we've had this austerity of modernism for such a long time, and and then the the nihilism of postmodernism. It's time for a more positive outlook, and uh, representational art, I think, has the ability uh, to offer that. Uh, positivity and transcendence and beauty. Michael Pierce, thank you so much for talking with me today. That's my pleasure, Jason. Thank you for having me. It's a, a joy to talk to you about representational art in the 21st century. That was Michael Pierce, co-founder of Track, speaking to me via Skype in California. Next, we're going to hear from Alicia Ponzio. Alicia Ponzio studied and subsequently taught sculpture at the Florence Academy of Art here in Florence before returning to California in 2011. 
Alicia teaches sculpture and artistic anatomy courses at J. Hess Studios in San Francisco, as well as workshops in various locations around the United States and Canada. Her clients include Pixar Studios, the University of Calgary, and Brook Green Gardens. At Track 2015, among the painters, Ponzio was the sole demonstrator of sculptural technique, modeling a torso in clay from life over two evenings. So, Alicia Nicole Ponzio, thank you so much for coming on The Sculptor's Funeral today, talking with me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Now, at track, you were asked to give a, a demonstration in which you modeled a clay model, uh, a torso from life, and you had to do it in about six hours. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, I was uh, asked to do a demonstration. Most, most of the demonstrating artists were, well, all of them were painters other than me. So they had uh, four hours to demo, but uh, they allowed me to continue my demo for two nights, mm -hmm. uh, which I was very pleased with. And uh, Track supplied the model. Uh, he was fantastic, um, very good model and fun to work with. He looked and amazing. I, yes. <laughs> yeah. Great character yeah. and really happy to, happy to be modeling, happy to be there. In fact, he gave a presentation at Track about the model's experience. He was really oh, involved. Oh, no kidding. Awesome. Yeah. It was really neat. I didn't get to go to it, but uh, he told me a little bit about it. But um, as far as the demo goes, uh, it was it was really a great experience. I was working from about 7 p.m. till midnight both nights. Till midnight. Till midnight, pretty much. 11:45 they had us. And uh, at first, I, I thought that was a little bit of an odd choice. I usually, don't uh, at these conferences don't end up demoing late at night like that. But um, I actually thought it was a really great idea after experiencing it because people were at um, papers and talks all day long dealing with uh, theoretical issues and talking about their art. And I think in the evening, the opportunity to just watch another artist demo was, was kind of relaxing and fun and brought people together. I thought it was a really great way to do it in the end. Right. Yeah. And so you were, you were talking as you worked and explaining things. Uh, did people have a lot of questions about your technique? They did, and I wasn't necessarily explaining every step, um, partly because uh, I wanted to just sort of showcase how it's done without interruption, but I do encourage people to ask questions, and I really I really appreciate that, also because I teach a great deal. It, it helps people to understand what they're looking at, and I think asking the questions keeps them engaged. So there was conversation a lot at some points. Sometimes I was working for half an hour, an hour uninterrupted, mm. so it just ended um right. but there were a couple of really hardcore people that stayed for the whole uh 10 hours really of the demo no kidding uh, were yes. they were they sculptors or were they painters uh, they were both mm -hmm. they were both actually there were two or three that were there every minute i think wow. and um asking questions and really engaged and then there were a lot of people that came and went throughout which mm -hmm. was great um i would say the majority of the people at the conference were painters i could safely say yeah, uh, I'm sure. Yes, but there there were uh, there was there were presentations about sculpture. Mm -hmm. There were other sculptors present, and I would say there was a great deal of interest in watching a sculpture demo, at least from the feedback that I received. Right. I don't know if I've seen too many times uh, a, a sculpture demo using a live model before. Painting demos are are quite common, but sculpture is a it's it's different. It's there's just more involved in the creation of a a clay model than a than an oil sketch, for instance. So it's really cool that you were able to do it, and I understand why you know because of that you know you were you were you know alone in terms of all the uh, the demonstrating artists. I think there were like seven or eight other artists demonstrating, and they were all painters. Is that is that right? Yes, that seems about right. I didn't know the exact number, but yes, they were all painters for mm. sure. Uh, or some people did drawings, of course. But, right, yeah. right. Um, but uh, something, of course, I demonstrate a lot in the classroom when I'm teaching, uh, usually 15, 20-minute demos to get people started. Mm -hmm. But I've only started doing these demonstrations I think, a, year, uh, a little over a year ago at the Portrait Society from a live model in front of a larger audience. Um, mainly because another sculptor, Marty Rees, and I saw that there was um, interest in it, but also that it wasn't being done too often at the conferences. So people didn't, they do seem to have an interest in sculpture, but they don't seem to see a lot of, of it at the conferences. So we wanted to try to kind of get that started, you know, as much as we could. Oh, that's great. So did you approach uh, Track with the idea of doing a demo, or because you had done a demo at another conference, Track approached you? 
It was the latter, yes. They, oh, great. But at the Portrait Society, uh, Marty Rees and I approached them the first time we did a demo together, um, and they were really happy to. You know, the, the leader of the Portrait Society, the, um, the director, Ed Jonas, is a sculptor as well, and he was really happy that we, we volunteered to do it. Oh, I think it's great, and I think it's also pretty brave <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, it's it's really fun, actually. I uh, I thought it would be a little more intimidating the first time I did a demonstration in public like that, but it was kind of exhilarating to just um, to just get out there and go for it, just give it a try, and and help me to sort of um, streamline my own process a little more. Think about what's actually essential if you only have a limited amount of time. Right. So. Right. Listen, um, I'm interested in how you felt um, as. Uh, in the minority, whenever there's a conference that includes painters and sculptors, I'm sure uh, sculptors are always in the minority. Um, how do how do you how do you feel? Well, I don't want to say how do you feel about it, but when you're there uh, in in the conference, do you feel the need to sort of fight for the <laughs> fight for the interests of sculpture, or sort of uh, be a little bit more vocal, or or make the sculptural presence known a bit more? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I try to look at it as a, uh, not a strength, an advantage, that, that sculptures, sculptors are in the minority. There are fewer of them, I think, in general. There yeah. are fewer sculptors in the field. Um, but I try to look at it as an advantage that there's a smaller um, number of sculptors at these conferences, so you, you can get the opportunity to, to get out there and, and um, get attention for what you do. Because people are interested, as I mentioned. Uh, a lot of yeah. the painters are fascinated by seeing the process, um, but um, they maybe haven't been exposed to it as much. So, um, a couple of, I guess, a couple of things that I uh, go through in my own mind are: I try to think of it as an advantage. I try to um, also think of us all as figurative artists. I think that track did a pretty good job of presenting the information that was applicable to either sculptors or painters. Do you think uh, that there were anything? There's anything that. Uh... Uh, time and again at conferences like these uh, gets left out because of just not not intentionally, but just uh, because these are generally organized by people who are painters or come from from a painting sort of background, um, you know, issues that don't get addressed that that are pertinent to sculptors, perhaps more than painters. Certainly. I mean, I, I guess I felt that more at the Portrait Society in the past because um, a lot of the present patients there tend to focus a little more on the technical aspects of creating figurative art. Right, right. Um, and most of the presentations are by painters on that level, and the vendors that are present, which is a big part of the conference, mm -hmm. are all, all painter-focused. Uh, I don't think I've seen any vendors there that are, I can't recall any vendors that were focused on sculpture supply, and none at the Portrait Society either. Hmm. Um, I, I think in my own personal opinion, a lot of sculptors get their supplies at places like Home Depot or, you know. Or... <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. Lowe's, Home Depot, hardware stores, uh, ceramic uh, supplies rather than, you know, fine art supply stores. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, here in here in Florence, I'm sure you you know that, uh, you know, Zeki, the, you know, world famous art supply store has, you know, crap for sculpture. You know, it really doesn't have much at all. Exactly, I would agree with that. And but another part of it is, I mean, I I, um, I think a lot of us make our own tools. I make my own armatures. Mm. I don't know that I that a vending vending opportunity would be very lucrative for a sculpture supply store. I mean, and also, for example, if I were to buy clay at a conference, how am I going to ship it home without spending? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not being a vendor, I couldn't say what the possibilities are. But um, no, that's a good point, though. It's a good point. You know, one one issue that I think um, is largely unaddressed or it doesn't get enough attention uh, from conferences and, you know, sort of the, the atelier movement, you know, the whole, you know, sort of scene is um, the role of public art uh, in what we're doing. And I think it's because um, public art is largely the domain, the domain of sculpture rather than painters, right? Painters interact with their public largely through galleries as do sculptors. Uh, but the way that the public the average man on the street interacts with art is on the street through public art. And that's one of the areas of concern that I just never have seen addressed in, in these conferences. Hmm. I think it's largely because it's a sculptural concern. It, you're probably right about that. I think that's a great point. I'm yeah. trying to 
saw many presentations that were focused on the role of public art and you know off the top of my head I can't think of any uh, yeah and it's crazy because historically that's that's where you know it's sculpture in public places that pushes the dialogue forward you know whether it's Michelangelo's David or or Carpo's dance or or Rodin's you know gates of hell you know public sculpture is where the public is exposed to what we do whether they seek art or not no no that's a very good point I, I have met other artists who participate in these conferences who do focus on making and building monuments and that sort of thing. Um, but their, their particular form, art form isn't discussed in detail at the conference. Uh, the sculptor I mentioned earlier, Marty, Marty Reeves, her entire yeah. practice is pretty much building monuments. Um, but normally if she's entering a competition, she'll enter more personal works. So yeah, um, or Bruce Wolf, for example, has participated in the past in the Portrait Society's competitions and been recognized Say that name again. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that name. Bruce Wolf. Bruce Wolf. Okay. Yes, who's a very prominent uh, monumental sculptor in California, uh, lives in the Bay Area, uh, but very accomplished in making public monuments and um, on a massive scale sometimes. Hmm. But um, he, when he has entered the Portrait Society competition, for example, that I know of, it's been with a, a bust so that could have no. That's not necessarily a public artwork. But. Right. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, something maybe that could be a um, a topic of discussion for future, um, you know, discussions between figurative artists at track or other venues. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to see that happen. So tell me a little bit more about track. Like, what was the experience of being there? I mean, I've seen all the pictures on Facebook, and it's great. I mean, there's there's a, there was obviously some sort of costume ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it looked. It, I gotta say, from the from the photos on Facebook, from from you and everybody else, it seems as though it was just like a big party. Uh, it does seem that way, doesn't it? Actually, uh, and and part of it is that it's getting together with other figurative artists, meeting people that you haven't met before. Um, one of the things I, I enjoyed about track and the environment was the majority of people there were working artists. It was a lot of professionals getting together and. Um, Normally, when you get together with your friends, you may not even talk about art or what you do as a profession. But because of the venue, even when we weren't in a presentation, we were talking about the field of figurative art and its repercussions. So that was a really nice aspect of it. I think um, it was a fun environment, but also there was work that was done, too. And the environment was was wonderful in, in terms of there was always something to go to. Um, my, my biggest complaint was that the, every minute there was too much to choose from. I have oh, to really? say, yet yeah, there were four or five papers presented at a time, so you had to choose between those in order to. Um, yeah, you, you couldn't attend obviously all four at once, so you had to choose between them. And so by design, you're going to miss out on quite a few of the presentations. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was a little bit. Uh, it felt a little bit hectic, um, mm-hmm. and. Um, there were some keynote speakers that were singled out where that was the only presentation going on at the time. Um, Samir Zaki, Dr. Samir Zaki, for example, a neuroscientist, uh, was one of the keynote speakers, and uh, I really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, but the papers that were written by artists and, and art uh, critics and that sort of thing, generally there were very, very many of them going on at a time. Wow. So that, would, that was one thing that was a little bit overwhelming. Um, but... There was always something going on, which was a positive. There were also many events at galleries around town, in Ventura and, and nearby towns. I saw that. You guys would uh, sort of take tours, right? There were buses. Um, personally, I, I had a car with me, so I just drove to them. But um, he, conveniently, they had buses so that everybody could just hop on the bus and go to the gallery show that was going on at that time. Mm-hmm. And that was really nice uh, because people didn't feel like they had to, to work too hard to get out to the different events. Right. And uh, Michael, and I, I'm not sure if it was just Michael, but he, he and his uh, colleagues set up various shows at different galleries, museums, different venues around town. Cal Lutheran Campus had a couple of different shows going on. So uh, the artists that were involved in the discussion, either as presenters or just attending the conference, were well represented. Hmm. It's kind of, I mean, that's what, what we're all about is um, is making artwork. So it was probably a great idea to have the artwork present as well as the discussion. Was there any sort of uh, standout presentation that really sort of um, has stuck with you? I know it's 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 only been, I mean, it hasn't even been a week since uh, track ended, but is there something that really 
now that it's ended, it really sort of uh, sticks in your mind as something you'll you'll walk away with and and sort of affect you affect your yeah. work. Um, there were a couple of different presentations that I really enjoyed. Uh, one of them was the one I mentioned just a moment ago, Dr. Samir Zeki, mm-hmm. who uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, is a neuroscientist who who studies often the um, I don't even know if I would know how to describe his research, so I apologize in advance if I don't (laughs) in full service, but he's uh, describing the physiology of beauty, if you will, like how how the brain um, sort of registers beauty. Right, sort of neurologically. Yes, and Mm -hmm. I've written a book about it. I I actually bought the book at the conference, but I haven't had a chance to really go through it yet. But um, he was uh, really, I thought, an excellent speaker because he... Um, was able to speak on a layman's level and describe his research to people that weren't familiar with neuroscience and their methods and um, relate it to all of our practice, I suppose. Uh, So he was, I thought, really interesting and fascinating to listen to and clearly an expert in his field. So uh, it was kind of a great opportunity to listen to him. Hmm. Um, I also, I did attend Poppy Fields' lecture about Rob Bodum and Roseanne, and I thought that was, um, she made some really great points there, and um, that was exciting to listen to as well. Uh, Poppy's a a young student at the Florence Academy, so I was inspired to see her sort of thinking about the bigger picture of what she's learning. She had a good perspective. Uh, She was making a point about sort of how the market has changed from the times of Rodin to, to now, and how that could affect any particular artist's career. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. I've met her before, but enjoyed seeing her again at the conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also attended Alexei Steele's presentation about his father, um, this Russian painter Leonid Steele. And I thought he made some really um, interesting parallels between uh, his father's generation of painters and, and artists in general, and uh, sort of what the figurative art movement is going through now. And, and he... He described art in terms that I'd never heard it described before as a sort of spiritual uh, survival. Hmm. And it was relevant in the context of his father's life, who went through a great many hardships, but still continued painting. Um, But it was really an interesting perspective to hear as well. So some of the papers were personal, related directly to the presenter's life. I think in the case even of Poppy's presentation, you could say in some ways it's personal because she's talking about her teacher and her experiences at the Florence Academy quite a bit. And Lexi as well, because he's talking about his father, who also happens to be his mentor and great inspiration. But I, I find those presentations fascinating because what really makes someone create art or what really inspires them, I think, um, we can all relate to that. Yeah. So, I'm so jealous. I really wanted to go to track uh, this year, but obviously, you know, it's a third of the way around the world from me. And, uh, you know, as someone who's been there, speaking to someone who is not, um, what would you say is the the practical benefit of attending a conference like this? For instance, I can I can buy the book just like I did last year. You know, I bought track 2014's book and I know that um, the papers that were presented at track 2015 will be bound together and, and available uh, for sale. Um, and I find it great. I, find, I, you know, it's, it's a very valuable sort of reference and resource to be able to go back and, and read some of these things. Um, but what, what do you feel you've gotten out of track? I mean, mm-hmm. what's the, what's, what's the big picture? What do you walk away from, uh, with? Well, I was saying to, to Justin, my, my partner or anyone, mm-hmm. that we were, I was just saying this when we were sort of in the car alone after a conference or after a particular presentation, the real benefit was um, not only do we get to experience the content of the presentation, which you can as well by reading the book, but it was the discussions afterwards with friends. And, and I mentioned earlier in, the, in the, this interview, too, it was about discussing the presentation immediately afterward with other artists that you know and, and respect or find interesting. So that, I think, was the benefit of being there in person, being in the room. Uh, it's a different experience to read the presentation uh, and then to be there to actually discuss it either with the presenter or with other artists that have their own opinions about it. And sometimes we found we really disagreed on on whether the whether the speaker accomplished what they were trying to accomplish or whether we agreed with their points. So that was interesting. It kind of opened my mind up in different ways. 
there was one speaker, Michael Zakian, for example, who is uh, more of an art historian and art critic, not not a studio artist. Although he did study drawing with Adrian Gottlieb, apparently, from what he said. Um, but he um, actually had some concrete examples. He was doing a slideshow, and I think some people, at least from me talking to them, were offended by it because he would show images of people's artwork who may have even been in the show, might have even been sitting in the room, and uh, use them as negative examples. He was talking about what is, it, what is content in art, and some of the images he brought up, he was saying this, this content fails, this, this particular painting fails to, uh, to actually come together in a coherent way. Wow, uh, wow. So I don't think a lot of people uh, are used to or were used to or were open to that. We're not, we're not really ready to hear that because I think as artists we can put ourselves in that artist's place and say, wow, here we are at the show and, and this guy's saying negative things about my painting and so it, it hits home with a lot of people. Um, hmm. I actually appreciated it. I, I was gonna, I was gonna say. I think I would, I would, even if I disagreed. I think I would appreciate um, the idea that it wasn't all just sort of, you know, track but, as you know, group therapy, and they yeah. were all patting each other's backs. And uh, and you, you actually used the phrase um, uh, that you thought that. Uh, some people weren't ready to hear that. And I think that's, I, I think that's a very telling phrase. I think as, as you know, this movement, whatever you want to call it, grows and gets stronger, I think we're going to have to develop thicker skins in the face of people who will start to take us seriously enough to disagree with us. Yes, well, I agree. I do. And then, you know, as much as I wouldn't want my work necessarily singled out in a negative way, if it did happen, <laughs> I would hope that I could... <laughs> I would hope that I'd be ready to hear it, honestly, because uh, I do think that someone who's honest with you about their opinion is really, in a sense, respecting you more. Absolutely. Who tells you positive things uh, without really meaning them, not sincerely. So, um, so I appreciated it. I thought it was brave that he did that. Um, the artists that he did single out were all pretty well established to the point where I think they probably wouldn't be harmed by a little bit of negative uh, feedback. And it's it's possible that they've heard it before as well, you know, being... And some, some of them are personal friends of Michael Dickens. So as I mentioned, he's being honest with people that he respects and knows. You know, it's not... He wasn't singling out someone who just graduated from school and is trying to survive, you know. Uh, I don't think, anyway. You know, that was my impression. So um, I thought it was, it was good that he did that in the end. Um, but people I spoke with, many disagreed. So it was really interesting. That part was really interesting for me. Well, that's that's great. Listen, Alicia Nicole Ponzio, it's been a real pleasure. It's 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 sort of crazy that we've never met, <laughs> because you know we're both here in Florence at the same time for years. For I mean, you, know. you were there when 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 did you arrive? Oh, uh, nineteen ninety six. Oh yes, you you were there when I was there the whole time, definitely. So yeah. I'm... Well, I, I've been I've been back and forth, but I've been here solidly since two thousand and uh, two thousand and nine. But I I, I I don't think I've ever been more than twelve months away. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get to meet there, but I'm glad we had the chance to talk now. And, and I really appreciate your your podcast and uh, what you're doing for the field of figurative sculpture. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I look forward to when we actually do meet face to face. Me too. You can see some images of Alicia Ponzio's demonstration piece she created at Track at the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com. Next, we're going to hear from Poppy Field, a once and future student of sculpture currently studying art history in London, when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hey, podcast listeners. The Sculptor's Funeral is made possible by your generous donations, as well as by our sponsor, Blick Art Supplies. That's right, friends. Blick Art Supplies, the largest and oldest provider of art supplies in the United States, shipping their quality wares around the world. Their superior customer service, extensive selection, and competitive prices make them the choice for professional and amateur artists, art educators, architects, designers, students, and hobbyists. Virtually anyone requiring quality art materials for work or for pleasure. And seriously, there isn't another art supplier on the web with as many supplies and materials specifically for sculptors than Blick. It's really huge. They have over 70,000 products for artists of all types. You can get everything you need from dozens of different clays and plasters, 
to fine Italian marble carving tools, clay modeling tools, specialty casting mediums, body casting supplies, turntables, armatures, books on sculpture, you name it. If you need it for sculpture, they got it. And shipping is free in the U.S. for most items if your order is over $100. But Blake is not merely a place to buy stuff. Their sales staff and product information specialists are trained to hunt down answers to your tough questions regarding materials, techniques, and safety. Hundreds of Blick videos are also available at dickblick.com and on YouTube, including video lesson plans for teachers and product demonstrations for artists. And best of all, by buying your art supplies from Blick, you contribute directly to the support of the Sculptor's Funeral podcast. All you need to do is this. Go to the podcast website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and click on any of the banner links that you see there. And that will take you right to the Blick website where you can buy whatever you need. It's that simple. Just remember that you need to click through a link on thesculptorsfuneral.com first so that Blick knows I sent you. And so the next time you stock up on armature wire, mold rubber, modeling tools, and plastilina, do it in a way that supports the only podcast out there devoted to the global community of figurative sculpture. Go to thesculptorsfuneral.com and click on Blick and support the show. Thanks. <music> My next interview is with Poppy Field. Poppy Field is a History of Art undergraduate at the Courthold Institute of Art in London. Prior to this, she spent one year training in sculpture at the Florence Academy of Art in Florence. Field is also the co-head of exhibition for the 12th edition of the East Wing Biennale, a student-organized contemporary art exhibition at the Courthold Institute of Art. She has also worked for the Artists Collecting Society, the Contemporary African Art Fair, and Digiqualia.com. At Track, Field presented a paper in front of an audience entitled Rodin and Bodum, The Importance of Cultural Biographies to Public Placement of Post-Contemporary Representational Sculpture. Well, fantastic. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Recovered from my jet lag and back into the swing of things at university. Thank how, goodness. How long have you been back? Um, I got back late on Thursday night, so hmm. a long weekend. So yeah, I... it's a nine-hour trip, isn't it? Or a nine, <laughs> hour, nine hours difference. Yeah, that's a long, long way to come. Well, excellent, excellent. I talked to Alicia Ponzio this morning. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. I had to get up at six in the morning. Well, actually, <laughs> earlier than that. Uh, and then talked to her, it, it being 9 p.m. her time mm -hmm. yesterday. Oh, yes. She was absolutely fantastic. You know, it actually amazes me that I'd done a whole year at the Florence Academy of Art and not actually seen a sculptural demonstration ever. Really? So to, really, so to have eight hours... Um, watching a graduate who works in a similar method to the way I've been trained just fly with the clay. Um, yeah, it was incomparable to anything else, actually. I mean, of course, we're shown um, basic stages, but not something from conception to looking like a figure, because the time that takes is, is valuable for teaching other things, I suppose. No, it makes sense, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to learn how to do a figure, but it's another thing to actually do a figure in eight hours from start to uh, start to finish. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So Poppy Field, you're a student right now at the Courtauld Institute in London, correct? Yes, that is. And you flew all the way out to California for Track 2015. Yeah, it's quite mad, but I did. Well, so tell me about that. The conference obviously means a good deal to you. What, what were you hoping the conference to be? And, and uh, what were you hoping it, for, you know, to, to do? Did it, did it mm -hmm. live up to your expectations? Wow. Okay. So I think there, there were two things that it, it meant to me. And one was um, from an academic perspective and the other was as a sculptor. Mm -hmm. And I'll start with the academic, which is, I make it sound quite dramatic. It's really not that dramatic, but um, I am leaving academia at the end of this year and going back to the Florence Academy to finish my training. So it's quite keen that... I would um, at least participate in one conference. And while there is a conference of art history that happens every February here in London, I mean, you know, I, I want to, to be a sculptor, a representational artist. So this is the highlight of, of that in terms of representational art. So from an academic perspective, that was why I wanted to take part. And from a sculptor's perspective, I mean, it's, it's this gathering of, I suppose, the keenest people who are able to attend and just would have been mad not to take that opportunity when I could be a participant in it rather than simply an audience member. So 
um, those were my reasons for taking part. No, um, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, it surprised me actually to find that you uh, were presenting uh, a paper there, uh, and <laughs> so I, I should say surprised and pleased. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and now now I, I understand a little bit more about why you chose now, because when you say you're leaving academia mm-hmm. uh, to become a, a sculptor, does that mean you're, you're you know, I, obviously your your work at the Cortal Institute is coming to an end. But are you really going to switch focus or do you think you'll try to maintain a dual role of a working artist and, uh, uh, you know, a, a dabbling academic, perhaps? I mean, of course, I'll always do my own research. I come from a family where my father and various relatives are professors and my brother has a PhD you know my my family is very into research so I certainly couldn't leave my library but you know my, my focus will change and I think well as I'm sure you're aware there are demands uh, on your time. Well let's talk about your presentation um, now in your presentation you used August Rodin and Robert Bodum to make a mm-hmm. comparison uh, between I guess, the contemporary reception of art in the late 19th century and the reception of art today. Now, I understand you weren't comparing the sculpture of Rodin to the sculpture of Robert Bodum, but rather using a sculpture produced by each as the start of a comparison between two very different uh, moments in art history. Yeah, Can Mm -hmm. you you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, um, I just really wanted to work out what had changed what the conditions were that had changed that made uh, students today or the public today not aware that there is um, a classical realist art education in the way that they would have been during uh, during Rodin's time and that actually works are still being created with similar academic techniques and I felt that uh, Rodin was the last great figurative sculptor to truly be a household name and that was a little controversial because people brought up Giacometti and Henry Moore. I actually would argue that um, for the audience at track, if, if they had been presented with, with works by the sculptor, they wouldn't necessarily feel that they were responding in the same way that they are. So that's what I wanted to work out, and that's why I chose Rodin. And I chose Rob because, of course, I have um, a personal connection to his work, having trained under him, and that allowed me access so I could continuously badger him with questions. It was and, very useful. And Robert Bodum, I should explain, is the head of the sculpture department at Florence Academy of Art in, exactly. here in Florence, where, you, where you, you've done one year so far. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, your presentation draws on um, the theories of a few anthropologists, Alfred Gell and Igor Kopitov. I mm-hmm. hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. I think it's fascinating that, the, that um, you're turning to the work of anthropologists and not necessarily art historians or art critics, although obviously they, they are uh, pursuing interests in, in art or pursued. Can you tell me a little bit more about these two, uh, two people and, and their work? Yes, so the, um, the papers that I drew on by each of them were focusing around the idea of, of I suppose, objects, which is in looking at sculptures as, sculptures as objects, I think it allowed me to step back from... Uh, the sometimes tenuous position of an art critic or writer or researcher. Mm-hmm. And I used Afrigel to work out what does and does not constitute art. So he has three theories of art, the aesthetic, the interpretive, and the institutional theories. And I was trying to work out where the art that uh, we create in, in Florence fits into that as opposed to that which saturates the Western art market, which is conceptual and contemporary art. And with Igor Kopitov, I used um, his notion of a cultural biography, um, that is what a, an object is and what its story is, to create biographies for a work by Rodin and work by Bodum. I, I love the idea of breaking, uh, breaking it's, it's almost like a point, point of view. He's breaking it down to points of view, like how different ways you can look at the world of art, the aesthetic, exactly. the interpretive and the institutional theory. And, and I it's, think- Sometimes the problem with referring to art historians and the big debate of what is art is that there just there just won't be an answer. I've never come across an answer so simple as uh, this one from an anthropologist's perspective. So, right, right, because he doesn't try to make an all encapsulating uh, declaration on what is art and what isn't art. He actually says, well, from this point of view, this is art. 
And from this other point of view, this is art. And I think that's really exactly. interesting. And I love, I got to say, I love the institutional theory of art. Mm-hmm. It helps, it, for me, it helps to explain so much about the contemporary art world and art market. Could you, could you just briefly give an overview of the institutional theory? Yeah, so the institutional theory is literally when an object is placed within an art setting. Um, so you would see it in a museum or gallery or when it's described as art using the semantic field of art criticism or appreciation by the art world. So unfortunately, that doesn't mean that a small child could walk in um, to, I don't know, um, I don't know, to a park and say that that bench is art. But if an art critic were to walk in and write an article saying it was art, it it would become art. And it's actually been an incredibly liberating approach because as such, there is an abundance of artwork with no aesthetic signature from installations to performance arts and just incredibly arbitrary objects. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and you make the point you go all the way back to uh, um, to uh, Marcel Duchamp with uh, that idea. Yeah. I mean, that would actually fit within the interpretive theory. Oh, um, really? Oh, no, I screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, um, well, can you give me an ex- so well, can you explain uh, the interpretive theory? Yes. So that's when, I mean, of course, you know, it's a tricky thing because it could fit within both. But um, I would just imagine that Fountain is perhaps uh, more settled within the interpretive theory because it's when something fits within a system of ideas based upon the art historical tradition. So that's something that is much more conceptual rather than having um, an external aesthetic. So that it doesn't necessarily have a symbolic uh, function. It's simply with, within the system of ideas. Right. I think I understand. <laughs> no, it's fascinating. But yeah, but yeah, back to the institutional theory. It, yeah. I won't say it, it justifies, but it certainly explains so much of um, the art world's uh, perspective uh, on art that, you know, basically it's, reliance on an authority to tell the public what is and what is not art. Mm-hmm. And for me, you know, it, f- from a historical perspective, it's interesting. It, it's almost like it's a substitute for the older system of officially sanctioned art, you know, official art that was promoted by whoever, you know, Louis the Fourteenth or the Pope or um, the a- Academy Royale. You know, mm-hmm. basically these these official institutions that would say this is this is the kind of thing that art is and this is what artists should be working towards. Um, and it seems to be uh, we have we have a replacement for the monarchs and for the the academy uh, in in the form of art critics, um, mm-hmm. gallery owners and uh, millionaire uh, collectors, I guess. Well, let's let's get back to um, uh, the comparison of Rodin and, and Robert Bodum's work, um, not in terms of works themselves, but in, in terms of their reception by the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you explain your, your sort of conclusions on uh, the comparison between how things were handled in the 19th century and how things are handled now and, and, and the tangible physical differences uh, in terms of uh, how the work is produced and marketed? And... Yes. Yeah, so in my talk, I probably a little Im- embarrassingly actually referred to the kiss as a number one that charts for weeks because um, I was thinking of Adele at the time because she just released a new song and I think she's fantastic um, and the year before she'd done a James uh, a song for the James Bond Skyfall and I just kind of felt you know she's she's a great singer she's um, got this incredible orchestra behind her she's got the the marketing campaign of the film it just it just had everything And I felt that The Kiss was quite similar because um, it depicts a story recorded by Dante. So we had the writer, and Rodin, of course, would be Adele. Sorry, Rodin, you're probably (laughs) turning in your grave, but he would be the singer, um, the foundries, the orchestra, and the French government, the publicist. Because at the time that Rodin created this, there was um, such an overwhelming desire for for this art that... um, you know, the demands were so high that he actually authorized Foundry to re- reproduce over 300 reproductions of um, the 1898 marbled version in four scales of reduction. Um, and in France, I think um, there was a device that was um, 
that was created in the 1830s that would allow these reproductions to be done in various scales um, absolutely perfectly. Mm. And by um, 1878, I think it was, French bronze foundries actually employed 7,500 workers. And I think their annual turnover was about 80 million francs. So it was a huge industry. Mm. Um, well, then I think I think your comparison to the music industry of today is absolutely apt because what you're talking about describing, you know, the, the you know, all the people behind Adele's, you know, song, the publicist and the writer and everything and, and the same sorts of uh, infrastructure were in place for Rodin because the 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 um, industry was there. Um, exactly. That, you know, so there was there was enough demand for sculpture that there was an infrastructure that could support that mm-hmm. sort of output by Rodin. Yeah, and it was financially viable in the beginning, but um, sculptors did struggle to regain control over their, their works. So by the 1900s, the early 1900s, the concept of the limited edition was born, which um, created a sense of rarity and quality and resale value, mm-hmm. which has you know, been of fundamental importance to sculptors. But the problem is, is that in comparing the... I suppose the circumstances around these works, there are obviously the 300 reproductions of the kiss. And at the time of writing, um, the, the sculpture by Robert Bodum I was discussing was called Feline. And there were only three of that and there'll be no more than 12. And you know, this, is, this, this is important and, it, and it's also to do with um, notions such as artist resale right and copyright, the, why the dissemination isn't quite the same. But... What it means is that the general public aren't having access to these sculptures in the way that they would have done before. And there was a fascinating talk at track called 21st Century Museums and Representational Art. And it was a panel discussion by um, some incredible curators and critics. And they're kind of the general thing that they, they seem to be conveying is that actually there is a huge amount of resistance to representational art going in museums which is unfortunate, uh, something we all knew. Hmm. But listening to these four figures who were actually um, arguing that they were trying to change that was great. So I believe that it will happen. But what my paper, uh, I suppose, really was arguing was that when it does happen, we're going to need to have some notion of a cultural biography, some kind of description explaining why we see the works as they are, um, because otherwise I just, I, I don't know how a viewer would walk in and see a work by, such as that by Robert Bodum and, and instinctively know that it was produced today despite movements such as Cubism and Futurism and Surrealism. So and you think you, you're saying that someone might walk in and, and mistake it for an older work rather than a contemporary work? Exactly. And what, what do you think? You say you you talk about writing a cultural biography, but what does that mean in in real terms? Now, how how will a cultural biography um, sort of inform the public that this sort of thing is going on? What 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 form does the the cultural biography take? Okay, so if you imagine the biography of a person, it's yeah. uh, where they're born and who to and what they do with their life. It's it's their story, and in the same way, the cultural biography creates the story of the work so it it acknowledges that um objects or in this case art objects are culturally constructed entities Mm -hmm. so they're created within a culture um and that within that culture they're going to be endowed with culturally specific meanings so in terms for instance in this case i discussed um the significance of bronze because uh the way that um the kiss was disseminated was obviously in bronze reproduction Mm -hmm. and feline is cast in bronze so the significance of that and that over time they'll be reclassified into culturally constituted categories so in the way that our culture uh at the time kiss was created would have considered that high art whereas today uh unfortunately figurative art is supposedly more niche well it's really cool you know i I think it's great that you are, um, at least for a short time, attempting the dual role of working artist and working academic. Because in general, I think one of the most valuable things about track is not only does it galvanize individuals all working towards similar goals. You know, we all get to meet and and discuss ideas and that helps spread ideas amongst us. Mm -hmm. But I think most importantly, possibly, um, things like track provide a cogent message 
to those artists and academics and the public at large who otherwise might not consider a return to representational work as fully legitimate, mm-hmm. you know, in a cultural or an academic context, you know? And so is, is, is track itself building that cultural biography, do you think? Um, I do think, oh, that's kind of tricky. Because I haven't thought of cultural biography, which is probably silly of me, but in relation to people, events, only artwork. So, because yeah, because if 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 the cultural biography is tied merely or, or not merely but solely to um, the work itself, then then it's really up to, for instance, you know, to use your example, Rob Bodum, uh, it would be up to him to make it. Uh, to, to provide the contemporary context, whether that means not working in bronze or, mm-hmm. you know, providing sort of symbolic or, or some sort of physical clue in the work that says it is contemporary rather than mm-hmm. a 19th century. Because obviously, you know, at its face, it's a, it's a reclining nude in bronze and yeah. nothing says 19th century more than that. <laughs> so so I, th- I, th- I don't know. It seems as though um, it needs to be a, a broader context, perhaps, than just the work itself. Mm. You know, things like track providing that cultural biography am i am or am i totally off base no i no i, I think you you do have a point um i'm not, not entirely sure how to articulate a response other than to, to nod and smile but unfortunately that doesn't <laughs> doesn't translate well over time <laughs> well yeah I'll, I'll 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 make a note i'll, I'll point out to my <laughs> listeners that she is now nodding and smiling <laughs> so uh what's What's next up for you? Where where are you headed? Uh, you know, oh, you 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 um, you're wrapping things up. Well, I guess not. You still have a full academic year ahead of you. Yes. Yeah. So I, as thankfully, I only have one uh, project left now. This year has been a bit crazy. I was um, also working for a contemporary African art fair full time for the first month or so, which is fantastic. And I just I do want to take this opportunity to say I, I'm not against conceptual art or contemporary art. There are so many pieces that I do enjoy. I don't think that uh, figurative art has to exist um, like in, a, in a state of warfare with, with this other kind of conception of contemporary art. I don't think that's the case. They can, they can coexist. Um, I, you know, I'm so glad you, you said that, actually, and not, not that I assumed otherwise, but I think you're probably in the minority of our uh, group, our mutual friends and peers, yeah. in that your background in art includes the study of contemporary art. Yeah. And I think your presentation at track is valuable in that it places representational art in the context of contemporary art, but not from an outsider's viewpoint, nor from the point of view of opposition, Mm -hmm. which I think is a problem with some of the voices coming from within the representational art movement. You know, I think of, you know, Fred Ross, the founder of the Art Renewal Center. He kind of comes to mind as someone who's very confrontational and antagonistic towards contemporary art. And I appreciate your sort of dispassionate clarity in your presentation. I think it's a very helpful <laughs> attitude that we should all, you know, take so that we can more clearly understand the cultural context in which we're working. Yeah, I mean, I actually have to credit an actor uh, with pointing this out to me because um, he's a friend of mine and I remember him saying that he hates going to the theatre and for other actors to pick apart uh, performances and costumes because he, he just simply said, you know, we're all in this incredibly tough industry together. And if we don't support each other, who else will? You know, it's wonderful that people are putting themselves on the line and just going for it. And I think the same can be said for art. There were moments um, in some talks when the audience almost laughed cruelly at uh, things like Jeff Koons' Balloon Dog. And I really mm-hmm. wanted to... Um, I suppose to convey that that everyone is putting themselves out there and working hard, and I think we need to respect that, regardless of what the aesthetic is that they produce. It's even if you really hate, uh, you know, the aesthetic of of postmodernity and and conceptual art. Even if you you know can't stand Jeff Koons, mm-hmm. um, you can't not take him seriously. You can't you can't deride this sort of thing. It's 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 like making the mistake you know, of an arm, you know, on on the battlefield, an army sort of um, not respecting and underestimating their opponent. That's how you lose a battle. And I'm not, again, (laughs) and I hate to put it in the context of war, because again, it's not that. It's emphatically not. Um, But uh, yeah, you you, you can't... Who can hate a balloon dog? You know, it's cute. It's funny. Right, right. Yeah. 
you know, it, but yeah, but people get irked because that's art and that's more respected and that's more valuable than their work or, you know, other work that they value. Mm. And it's just so silly to get angry that other people value things you don't. The fact that Jeff Koons exists takes away mm-hmm. nothing from what, you know, you're doing if you're a representational artist. He, exactly. he, doesn't, he doesn't affect you in any way. And, he, and if you let him affect you in that way where you're fo- forced to, uh, you know, deride him and, and, and downplay you know, his worth. Because like him or not, he's, he's a cultural force, you know, and, yes. and, and like it or not, contemporary art is here and has mm-hmm. been here for a while and probably will still be with us for a little while longer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think I think you're right. I think it's a mistake to uh, to disrespect that. You can dislike it, but <laughs> maybe you can't disrespect it. Exactly. Well, that's a relief that we've got that out. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a hate mail. <laughs> Start, I suppose. Fantastic talking to you, Poppy Field. Thank you so much for uh, for talking with me today. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank you all for listening. Now, for pictures of Alicia Ponzio's demonstration and other events at Track, just surf on over to thesculptorsfuneral.com and click on the image gallery for this episode, which is episode number 42. Now, if you want to join in the conversation about Track and other topics, you can do so at the Facebook group page for The Sculptor's Funeral. Become a member of the group while you're there so you never miss an episode. And as always, you can subscribe to the podcast at Stitcher Mobile or on iTunes, or subscribe from any service from which you get your podcasts, and receive the podcast automatically downloaded on your PC, tablet, or mobile every week. And check out the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, where you can stream the complete archives of the show. You can check out the image galleries for this and each episode there as well. And if you're in the market for some art supplies, click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies. Doing so supports the podcast, and for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.